And now, Dr. Krieger's lecture program starts right now. As always, um, I always put the daily, sub the daily supplement protocol up. Um, covers a wide range of things because we all know we don't get the right nutrients in our foods. Um, it's not a hoax, it's not a fad. I mean, if you look at the research, it's a, it's a basic principle that the environment's changing, the world's going at a faster pace, we're exposed to more chemicals, cancer rates are going up. Um, so that's why the daily protocol is there. It's just something, you know, to kind of cushion the family, help give you a little bit of a, uh, well, actually a lot of insurance because your body's all biochemistry. And if you're not getting anything or missing anything, then it can create havoc and problems later that you only know are fixed by drugs, which should have never occurred in the first place. So um, that's why my daily protocol is up there. This is the uh, this is the office uh, web page. Uh, I, I just changed. I have two pages going on at once right now. So what I did was. Uh, I change if you go to www. or, or www.drkrieger.com. That's my whole Health America page that I've been using for a long time. This is the new page, and I'm trying to get a uh, I'm trying to get a lot of good information, get some member services um, behind the page because I have over 200 conditions that I've PDF'd and put in the background so that people can go to because. You know, I see a lot of people call me, you know, from Florida, from Alabama, from Georgia, and they're like, you know, I can't get in your office. What do you think I should do? You know, so this way they have an opportunity to see what I'm thinking and start to apply what I think they should do. And then if they need to, they can go see the doctor or, you know, come in and, and see me. So it's just, a, it's just another opportunity to look at this world and say, hey, Everything's not a drug, everything's not a surgery condition. So there's a lot of opportunity on the alternative side, as you'll see tonight, to take advantage of a lot of those health conditions. And all my lectures are on there, um, you know, recipes, all kinds of stuff that I'm trying to put in there right now, but it, it just takes time. It's, it's, a, it's a very time facilitating issue. So, but, Anything that happens, you, you know, you just go to my lecture or, or web page and you'll see all the information there. Um, I put new patient forms on there because, you know, I grew up as an asthma and allergy kid. So I was in the doctor's office all the time getting, you know, getting shots, taking allergy shots, um, you know, doing epinephrine shots. I mean, I was always in either a hospital or a medical doctor, but what a pain in the butt it is waiting in a doctor's office. You know, fill out this paperwork, now you're in two hours, and you know, you could have just printed it off, done it, walked in, and then it makes you more accessible so that it would fit you any easier or quicker as long as Barbara and Paul are on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I put the new patient forms. Um, this is a big issue. Uh, most people don't realize, there's a, I saw a couple articles probably months back that there's no difference between organic and inorganic foods. They're all the same, but somehow organic just costs a little more, inorganic costs a little less. But there's, huge di there's a huge difference. There's a lot of differences actually, and it's a whole lecture in itself. But I wanted to touch on two specific points because when this research article came out on Monsanto's corn, and if you focus on the underlying, 50% of the male rats and 70% of female rats died in the study. You cannot play with our food chain. You just can't do it. We're made from our food chain. So this was a huge, this is a huge article because, or a research article because, a lot of times when they test these genetically modified foods, they're only for 30 days. See, the FDA gives you 30 days, and then you got to write up 
a report after a study of 30 days. This was done under a 90-day period, and everything started getting real ugly. Okay? The biggest thing we have to know about a lot of our commercial, you know, grown vegetables and foods, these are all the genetically modified right now. There's about 90% are soy, probably 90 uh, corn, not so much squash, a little bit more potato going there, and then tomatoes are pretty, uh, pretty high too. But the issue is, is that when we treat vegetables that are inorganic with high fungicides, because you need fungicides, what happens is, <clears throat> you know, when somebody yells at you, do you get angrier? You know, you're like, well, they're yelling at me for you, I'll fire up. It's the same thing that happens with the plants. They know they're dying. You give them a fungicide, they overproduce mycotoxins. And those mycotoxins can affect your nervous system and cause a lot of detrimental nervous system problems, digestive problems, molds, uh, fungal problems, allergies, asthma, all those things. So that's a big difference between organic and inorganic. They don't use the fungicides. There's supposed to be as much as 50% more mycotoxins in inorganic foods as there are organic foods. That's huge. That's a big extra load on your body. Plus the, the mineral changes. The other thing is that most people don't realize is that synthetic nitrogen accelerates the actual growth of the fungus on the plants. And that's what they use and spread on the soil, synthetic nitrogen. So those two simple points alone are ample enough evidence to actually, from the research, to actually persuade you that, hey, it might cost a little bit more, but I got a mycotoxin level that's way lower and it's less detrimental to my health, okay? Um, a lot of, the research a lot of times talks about, you know, you need to be doing this, and you need to be doing that, and they get you on the runaround. Well, the American Cancer Society, which basically I look at, sits in the middle, and the American Cancer Society never really talks about the environment having an effect on especially cancers, but specifically breast cancer. I never hear anything. I hear alcohol and exercise and uh, your, your um, activity level, which those are all good, but the real issue is, is the environmental problem, and that's the main cause that people do not realize. It actually adds on or amplifies. Then, when you, when you drink too much or you're not eating correctly or you know, you, you, you're just not taking care of your body uh, how you're supposed to. So that's a major issue uh, with environmental. The American Cancer Society basically is involved with mammograms, uh, they got cancer drugs that they support, um, they're in the junk food industry, they do pesticides, petrochemicals, biotech, so really politically, they can't really say anything against these people because they do business with them. So how are you going to say, oh yeah, this chemical's bad, but yet, on the other hand, they're pouring in millions of dollars for the American Cancer Society. Okay? So there's a huge conflict of interest, and I'm going to show you a lot of the environmental today that are causing a majority of these problems, and a couple others, but mainly the environmental is a Huge issue. <clears throat> they used to use a drug called DES from 1940 to 1971 by Eli Lilly. And they actually, this family got their first payout. Because what they did was, in the 1940s and the 70s, what they, they gave this drug for miscarriages. If, you're, if you got a miscarriage, they give you a drug to help you so you don't have a miscarriage so you can possibly get pregnant. Well, they didn't realize that, first of all, it didn't help. 
And second of all, it raised your amount of cancer of, of, you know, who cares if it's rare? If it's up 40 times, is it really rare? I mean, you gotta look at this wording when they, when they describe these, but 40 times higher risk for a rare type of cancer of cells that of the cervix, vaginal wall, also known as adenocarcinoma, according to the National Cancer Institute webpage. This is also an issue, I believe, in a lot of these genetic cancers that have to do with, you heard about the BRCA gene? The BRCA gene is basically a breast cancer tumor suppressor gene that is actually active or inactive in 10 to 15% of women, so they can't fight off cancer. It's, a, it's an inherited issue. Probably happened in utero from some of these medications. Maybe, maybe not. But we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the issue of this case. This case is one small pinhead compared to all what's going on out there right now. I mean, it is absolutely huge. This was a victory for the DES daughters. Um, you know, mother uh, passed away, daughter's got cancer, you know, all kinds of issues. But it says, sadly, Eli Lilly did not have to admit fault, but in our society, a settlement is as much as an admission of guilt as anything else. They, didn't even miss, they, they were, they were misprescribing the drug. It never even worked for what they were prescribing. That's why it's misprescribed. And they knew that it created a lot of these, these issues, but they still went along with it. But they're not responsible. They're not at fault. How do you explain that? Seems like the medical profession always gets an easy pass. Always gets an easy pass. I don't know who this guy is. I have no idea who this guy is. I've never met him before. All I know is these are his credentials. He's a PhD. He works at the, uh, the sciences at the University of Arizona. He's my star of the lecture today because he has done some phenomenal research that you can apply to lower breast cancer risk, female hormone issues, and I'm gonna show you exactly one thing that he showed in his research that makes him a star, and this should be in the newspaper, literally in the newspaper. Because they tell you they don't have an answer, this guy showed you the answer. Okay? So remember him. <clears throat> California, they don't realize that white females have a higher percentage of breast cancer in this certain area, the North Bay area. They can't figure it out. They're like, why do they have such a high rate? African Americans, Latinos, Asians, yeah, they're getting breast cancer issues, but look at the whites. Holy smokes, way up there. They, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna try to figure this out. They're, they're not gonna come up with anything. I'll tell you right now. I already got the answer for them, okay? Something's poisoning them. And if you look, that ain't it. This one is. This is the issue. About 50% of Caucasians lack a detoxifying enzyme that increases the risk of cancer. So they're being, it shows it right in the statistics, 70% of the white females. That detoxifying enzyme ain't working and they're getting exposed to something in their environment. I don't know if it's in the air, the food, the water, snorting it, sniffing it. I have no idea, but that's a detoxification problem that's causing that high cancer risk, especially breast cancer. And it's going to be in the family of estrogen. Here's 40% of Caucasians, 35% of blacks, and only 14% of Asians. We can't deactivate, they're called slow acetylators, so they don't turn over and get those chemicals out of our body as quickly, and they pile up. And your body doesn't know what to do with them. And when it doesn't know what to do with it, what does it do? It deposits it in the fat tissue. Where's the fattest tissue in a female? Breast tissue. Very simple. 
This is the abstract I pulled out just to get it for the, for the camera. This is the acetyltransferase gene that's related to that actually is a huge modifier of environmentally, environmentally induced breast cancer uh, risk and finish wound. Because a lot of this has to do with genetics. <clears throat> the the fear mongering, the scaring, you have to get your mammogram every year, you have to do this, you have to do that. These are the statistics. Everybody likes to use this one. The lifetime risk is one in eight if you live to be 95 years old. One in eight, okay? They make it sound so dramatic. Oh, it's one in eight. We, we gotta get everybody in the door. We gotta run the mammogram. We gotta do the biopsy. Then, you know, so if you really sit back and look, you can, you can tell what's going on here. Everything kind of starts going down after the age of 50, okay? That's when women hit perimenopause and premenopause, okay? So I'm gonna talk about that, but it's a big scare tactic for me to go up to you and you say, you have a one in eight chance of a risk of cancer. That's huge, what do I do? Sign me up, I wanna follow the program so I never get it again, okay? Genes of cancer, everybody's all it's genetic, it's genetic. Well, some of it is, but a lot of it's not. What's happening is, what we're doing right now is what's happening. You're getting direct hits, direct assaults from the genes right now. Yeah, there's some exaggerated issues that we're going to be talking about, but 10 to 15% is inherited from mom, dad, family. 85% is acquired. That means that 85% of breast cancer is occurring with no family history of breast cancer at all. That's telling you that the environment is the key. These occur due to genetic mutations that happen as a result of aging. Pro now this is, this is what the American Cancer Society, I took this right off their brochure. Aging process and life in general. I mean, Doesn't that sound too broad? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't tell, they didn't tell us anything. Oh, he's getting old a little bit. You know, cancer doesn't happen just because you're getting old. It happens because you've been poisoned. There's a, and, and I'll show you the ones that do it. Life in general, rather than inherited mutations. <coughs> now, these are the types of breast cancers. There's hormone receptor positives, meaning that these receptors accept estrogen, they can accept progesterone, they can accept none, they have nothing to do with estrogen and progesterone. So basically, when we're dealing with breast cancer, 75% of all the breast cancers, 75% of them are ER positive or ester receptor positive. So any type of hormones, especially estrogen that we're going to be talking about today, will give you a risk. And I believe these numbers are going to go up because what the difference is, when you look in the literature, they talk about, um, they, what, what they mention is, there's a difference in oncology between an initiator and a promoter. There's cancer initiators and there's cancer promoters. They only look at estrogen as a promoter and not as an initiator. That's huge because that's going to change and it's going to drive this number up even higher to say, oh my God, estrogen is creating cancer. It's an initiator as well as a promoter. And that's what, that's where the research is heading. And that's where a lot of people want uh, these, the, the scientific stuff to go toward so that, you know, people can get, you know, early diagnosis. <coughs> so 65% are ER positive which are estrogen receptor positive and progesterone receptors. So there's progesterone receptors on there. I didn't know what, the best way to help with cancer is find out the receptors and shut them off. Shut off the receptors because those receptors actually send signals. The receptors sit outside the body, they send signals internally past the cell membrane into the DNA and tell the DNA what to do. So that is a major issue, is finding the receptors. This one, HER2 positive cancer, it's more aggressive and fast growing. Um, and then here's a triple negative, which 
doesn't have any of these three factors. It's just, they don't know, it's probably on the viral side. My viral, so that's the most aggressive. But what I want to focus on tonight is the 75% of the breast cancers that are estrogen positive or that are created by estrogen dominance in the body. That's what this is all about. If you can control estrogen in a female's body, you can control the statistics of cancer all the way in the future. If you are destined to get breast cancer in your lifetime, then the chances are four out of five that you will develop the disease after the age of 50. And the reason I'll show you the graph and explain why it happens that way. However, because only one in eight women will ever be diagnosed, if you have been cancer-free up to 50 at birthday, the odds are still very much in your favor. <clears throat> this is the main issue. Hormones are messengers. So you got the receptor, they send messages within the cell. They're the telephone lines to your, your DNA. What should it do? Should it protect you? Should it turn genes on? Or should it turn genes off? That's basically what's happening here. Hormones as messengers or biochemical messengers. Uh, the endocrine system produces a multitude of hormones, but everything's in balance. The problem, this will never change. People, you know, oh, my medical doctor knows. Oh, it, it, this principle never changes. It doesn't matter who tells you what. This principle never changes. It stands its own ground. When you have the wrong type of estrogen, meaning synthetic, test tube, laboratory made, they don't fit exactly and seed exactly into the, the key as they should. And that causes jamming. And when you cause jamming, you create extra signals, and those extra signals are grow signals, slow down signals even though it should be speeding up. So there's a huge, huge issue with anything that's synthetic that goes into the body for any type of treatment and you can't get it out because those drugs that bypass the liver so you can get them into the tissues are synthetic. What happens is those medications have half-lives. Synthetic estrogens have half-lives. And most of the synthetic estrogens have eight-week half-life. So your body's trying to get this out, trying to get this out, it's changing. So <clears throat> the, your keys to your car do not fit in my car. It's that simple. Keys are different. There's just a picture of the receptor. Estrogen dominance is the main focus of breast, ovary, and uterine health. Our exposure to estrogen is far higher than you would ever believe. This exposure is, it should be, is due to pseudoestrogens that act the same as estrogen in the body. These pseudoestrogens in medicine are called xenoestrogens, which are man-made chemicals with the same chemical structure as estrogen that accumulate in the body. Now, normal estrogen Normal estrogen, there's, there's, there's over 28 different estrogens in the body. The main ones that we look at are estrone, estradiol, and estradiol. Okay, Those are the three main estrogens in the body that have different functions, and they're still learning different functions that they have. The main one is estradiol up there, or E2, that's dominant, that starts when a female goes into puberty and the ovaries start to release estrogen. That's when it all starts. Goes into the blood, goes up to the pituitary, stimulates all these different things to happen at once. That's when it initially starts, okay? What happens is estrogen confers female secondary sex characteristics. It promotes cell growth in the uterus and breast tissue mostly. I mean, it's a promoter, you know, because it, it, it's supposed to run the female cycle. Estrogen signals the sequence that stimulates the maturation of the egg containing the follicle in the ovary. So that means it's the follicle-stimulating hormone 
And there's two there's two cycles that I have. I'm just kidding. I don't have any cycles. <laughs> Follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. There's the follicular stage, which estrogen signals to go, and then there's the luteal phase that stimulates progesterone to come into the equation now. So there you go up. Suppose estrogen goes up, progesterone is supposed to go up, they're supposed to meet at the top, and they're supposed to fall together. That rarely happens because there's a lot of female problems. Rarely happens. This is why your doctor wants to give you estrogen. It does a lot of wonderful things in the body, but it's synthetic. So we can't, we, they think they can control it. They can't control it as good as they think they can control it. Or the hormone or the Women's Health Initiative study in 2003 wouldn't have came across and said hormone replacement therapy at Premarin or Prempro creates cancer. Breast cancer. Stimulates the brain. Plays a cognitive memory emotional role. Increases body fat, especially in the hips, abdomen, and thighs. That's very important. Creates progesterone receptors. Uh, estrogen at puberty stops the growth of lung bones in both females and males. Increases the production of type 3 collagen which helps, that's why there's a lot of estrogen and things in your cosmetics. Promotes hydration, increases uh, HDLs, which are good ones, low LDLs, that can pile up, and then it, it allows so you don't have deposition of the cholesterol, and then it keeps the endothelial lining of the blood vessels pliable. Increases vascular into more muscle proliferation. okay? Now, these are the functions of progesterone, and I told you estrogen dominance is the main issue. But estrogen dominance is dominant when there's either too much estrogen or there's normal estrogen but too little progesterone. Those are your two scenarios. So you can have normal estrogen and your doctor says, oh, your estrogen is perfectly normal. And, but you have all types of PMS symptoms, headaches, muscle joint pain, fibromyalgia, you know, fatigue, anxiety, all kinds of stuff. But what happens is the progesterone gets real low. Progesterone is very protective in the body. So progesterone balances the effects of estrogen, prevents estrogen from overproducing the uterine lining, and it maintains the secretory endometrium. It also protects the developing fetus. This was the main issue I used on a lot of people, I said, you can never use synthetic estrogen while you're pregnant. Never. You can always use natural progesterone while you're pregnant because you will not, the synthetic impairs the fetal development. There are all kinds of problems. That's the huge difference. Stimulates new bone growth, helps burn fat for energy as a natural diuretic, increases libido, prevents uh, against breast, uterine, and, and, and all forms of cancer, helps sensitize estrogen receptors. Very, very important. We have all kinds of problems in society with sugars. Our sugars, our sugar, uh, um, when we have insulin, what happens? We get insulin, uh, what happens is insulin becomes de dysregulated and the receptors don't accept insulin because they're not sensitized. So what happens in our bodies, our pancreas has to overwork to compensate because the little bit we used to use, now we need a lot. It's almost like your body has a callus and it just builds up and you gotta, you gotta build up and use more and more. Same thing with estrogen because we're in an estrogen dominant society if you don't have progesterone, what happens is you can't sensitize the receptors and you'll overproduce even the estrogen that you're supposed to produce in your body normally, besides all the synthetic stuff. So that's very, very important. Functions as a precursor for other steroids. Let's keep going here. These are the typical symptoms of estrogen dominance or normal estrogen but low progesterone. Obviously libido, bloating, 
breast swelling, fibrocystic breast is a huge one, headaches, mood swings, weight, fat gain. I mean, women, I mean, just, they want to lose weight, control estrogen. Very simple. The ones that can't lose weight are estrogen dominant in probably 99% of the cases. Cold hands and feet, breast cancer, thyroid dysfunction, sluggish, foggy, trouble sleep thickening the urinary lining. I mean, I don't know how many females go in, they get ablations. You just get the inside uterine lining burned. Because they've been in estrogen dominance and that, that thin, thin, thin skin is now thick because they've been overproducing estrogen. Because they don't have progesterone to sensitize the cells. If they had progesterone, the lining would go back thin. Simple concept. PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, it's not all estrogen dominance, but part of it is, most of it's insulin. And premenstrual uh, increased blood clotting. This, this estrogen dominant is a vicious cycle because what happened is you get become estrogen dominant, you start to get cravings, you don't feel good, you start putting on weight, then you start messing with your blood sugar. And then after your blood sugar starts getting messed up, now your adrenals have to work harder and now you mess up your cortisol levels. And then your cortisol have levels have trouble and now your estrogen goes up more. And then your insulin gets messed up again and then you go back to the adrenals. So you're constantly in a vicious cycle chasing your tail. <clears throat> this is a subtle issue that somebody says, well, estrogen doesn't cause all breast cancers. This is an indirect way that estrogen can actually cause breast cancer or other cancers because they know they do. Basically what happens is there's proteins that carry iron. And iron never freely just roams through your body. Your body, immune system picks it up. You get oxidation, you get inflammation. It doesn't like things. Everything has to be a, have a protein carrier, okay? In this situation, when you have, when you drink alcohol, and alcohol increases free iron, so does estrogen. So alcohol is a main one. But also estrogen can cause the displacement of the iron too, so it's not bound anymore, it's free, and it can damage the tissues. So that's an indirect way that estrogen dominance can cause, um, cause uh, a lot of different cancers, not just breast cancer. Um, I don't want to belittle this, but menstrual cycle shorter than 28 days. Here's progesterone. Um, obviously fluid, there's tension, you got cramps, fibroids, lumps, all that stuff, pulse decreased, temperature decreased. All that stuff, you know, they used to use DES. This, this, is, how, this is how screwed up this is. They used to use DES, was it, which was an estrogen for miscarriages. They were totally in the wrong direction. It wasn't until Dr. Lee came along and said, hey, I think progesterone has a lot more to do with fertility than estrogen. And he was totally right, because when you have chronic abortion, or you have habitual abortions or miscarriages, what happens is your body doesn't get enough progesterone for fetal development and it miscarries the baby. So, they were in totally in the wrong direction for like 40 years, given estrogen for miscarriages when they should have been giving progesterone. And you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, I thought they had it all figured out. And you're paying for this. Literally. You're going to see what you're paying for later, too. This one's important because a lot of females, testosterone deficiency, there's a enzyme. Okay? You work out. Build testosterone. Mus weightlifting, building, not a lot of this aerobic stuff, but muscle work, all that stuff, helps to build testosterone. Well, if you have a little defect in this pathway for various reasons, 
What you do is the little testosterone you create, you convert it to estrogen. And you can't lose weight because you, you, you keep on converting it. And a lot of these females can, you know, grow beards. That's why, well, that's why I left this, uh, this, this rough today. <laughs> so that is a scenario. That's why most men don't get breast cancer. It's like one in a thousand get breast cancer. But most men don't get breast cancer because they hold on to their testosterone. They don't convert it into estrogen. More women have a tendency to do that. So that's why in the medical community for breast cancer, they use aromatase inhibitors to block the conversion of testosterone to estrogen in the breast. The higher the testosterone is in the breast, the lower the breast cancer, you're gonna get it. There's a couple products you can use, they're flavonoids, to actually convert this so it, it helps you. A lot of bodybuilders take advantage of this because they're like, yeah, because even men convert a little estrogen, testosterone to estrogen. And bodybuilders are thinking, I need more testosterone. I don't want any estrogen. I want more muscles. I want more mass, more power. So what they do is they block this enzyme too, and there's ways to block that in men to raise their testosterone a little bit, give them a little edge. Okay? These are mostly the causes of estrogen dominance. I'll go through a couple of them. It's usually a combination of things, but hormone imbalance, thyroid, adrenal, ovaries, hormone therapy. These are your false pseudoestrogens out of your environment, stressful lifestyle, diet, obesity, and then endocrine balance. Those are your main causes. This is the, this is the main one here that, this is the one that I think we have a lot more control of that we don't know about because they haven't told the American Cancer Society really hasn't told us. The Environmental Protection Agency lists it, but just because they list it as mutagenic doesn't mean it's going to be used less in companies and factories, you know, around the world or in your backyard. If you're getting your, your lawn sprayed or your house sprayed for termites or whatever you do. This is a big one in the flower industry. A lot of females like to mess in the garden, mess, mess uh, in the garden, not mess in the garden. That almost came out. Did you make that set? Yeah, we go going around. <laughs> I didn't say mess around. <laughs> but in the flower industry, there's some real toxic fungicides and pesticides that they use that you probably are digging around and you don't even realize it. You're going to be breathing it. So you got to be careful in the flower industry. It fits in with uh, this area over here. And then plastics, a lot of people heard of plastics. Well, um, plastics are a derivative of that DES they used to use with, for miscarriages. So they're very structurally uh, similar. So the body can mix them up. And they found a lot of they call them parabens, but they found a lot of plastics in females' breasts, the ones that had breast cancer. They also found in the ones that did it, get breast cancer, but they knew that there was, a, there was another initiated there. Could have been their cycles were off, could have been alcohol use, could, there's a lot of different things. But these are things you can do, not eating organic, not organic livestock, Try to get as much, you know, try to be as smart as you can without making yourself nuts. You know what I mean? Because they've turned the world into a nut factory. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right, let's go. Uh, let's talk about uh, oral contraceptives and estrogen. Everyone knows uh, oral contraceptives. Well, it's low dose, Dr. Krieger. It's still estrogen. Low dose to you might be high dose to you. There's different levels, there's different ways we regulate these chemicals. But estrogen just diminishes all your vitamins and minerals that actually do stuff in your body. That's the problem. <clears throat> uh, this was another one. You know, it wasn't just a 2003 study, but this was the, uh, a recent one. I pulled it up because it was April uh, 2012. 
This was from the Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Mass. What we found is that people should also be careful about long term. Now they're telling you not to use it at all. <clears throat> Here's the uh, statistics I pulled out. This is from London from the Evening uh, Standard. If you use birth control pills, less than five years, your risk of cervical cancer is 10%. Five to nine years, your cervical cancer was 60%. And then 10 years or more, you, get, you, you double. What's interesting about cervical cancer is cervical cancer is easy. You don't need to get a vaccine. You don't need to get the human papilloma vaccine for our daughters, and I'm not giving it to my daughters. I'm not giving it to my kids. I'm not, nobody should be getting that stuff, okay? The best way to control the human papilloma virus is to control estrogen and re-regulate the immune system. And there's two things that I use out of the office to do that. Actually, three things, but two things re-regulate the immune system so that you never get cervical or ferment penile or rectal or all these weird cancers. So estrogen is a promoter. All the women have fibroids. It's estrogen dominance, but they never knew they had the human papilloma virus in them because they just want to give everybody the shot. They don't want to just test anybody to find out what virus you have, just like they do a strep culture or a staph culture or, or a viral culture, find out if it's Epstein-Barr, Cytomegalo, who knows? But why not do a human papilloma virus test? Find out which one you have so that you know exactly, so that they can point you right in the right direction. Diet works wonderfully. Supplementation, you can clear it, no problem. I don't know if people, they don't want people most people aren't responsible out there. That's probably why they're not doing that. So, but it's, it's curable. I hate to use that word on film, but it is. This is what I use. If you're going to use birth control, make sure you cover all those nutritional deficiencies because, you know, I'm totally against being on birth control for female cycles, but if you're on birth control because of birth control, you can offset that. There's better ways to do it, and I'll show you. The, the one way that I would recommend, but this, if you're not, if you're going to do it, you got to make sure that you, you're covered. This is a sample from my member service. Basically, what it, what happened, what I have on my member service is I have over 200 conditions. This one's under birth control support. It gives you the description. It gives you the protocol, the dosage. This is um, OC companions used two, three times a day for as long as birth control pills are taken, so you cover that deficiency that everybody knows is created and causes cancer. And then these, folic acid, if you're thinking about getting pregnant, because a lot of times with birth control, you get a birth control syndrome, and you can't get pregnant, or the estrogen, when you look back at the vitamins, all those B vitamins are methylators, and those methylators are very important for building the spinal cord or causing, you know, the uh, uh, preventing cleft lip or cleft palate or spina bifida, all that stuff. So this gives you that, and then this helps you wash out, wash out estrogen if you take that dosage from day 14 and 28 for females in that cycle. And then this helps the liver metabolize estrogen, which I'm going to talk about. Here is, if you want to write down something good, this is the Billings ovulation method. It is not a drug approach to birth control. It's got a 97 to 99% success rate, which is higher than the pill. It's, it's easy to learn. You don't have to take any pills. You might have to control yourself. And then I have pictures at the end to kind of explain, but that's just a sample of, uh, uh, of all the other conditions. Stress is a big one. I talked about stress and the um, um, cortisol levels, cortisol leading to estrogen, estrogen leading to insulin, and then constantly going on and on. But a lot of times what happens is we might not have an estrogen problem, but we might have been born or had an issue with our mother or father that had a thyroid problem. And since we have that thyroid problem from mom or dad, 
we have an estrogen problem because we can't clear it because the thyroid's too slow and our metabolism's too slow. So everybody think, well, I have all this estrogen all the time. No, you can push the thyroid and it will help you get rid of estrogen if your primary problem is the thyroid and your secondary problem is estrogen. See how that works? So there's other things that can flip back and forth just to, so you don't you know, get you know, confused. But estrogen, too much estrogen, no matter if you had perfect parents, slows the thyroid down. Always causes a hypothyroid, sometimes an autoimmune thyroid, okay? <clears throat> Here's the hormone imbalance that, if you look at this picture, these are the age, 25 years old, 35, 50 years old. If you look at this, the dark black line is estrogen. When you look at 35, it starts dropping, okay? Then what happens is, at 50, you get a 35% reduction in estrogen. The problem is, estrogen and progesterone don't go down at the same time. You almost get a, when you look at progesterone and it falls, you get a 75% reduction. So you lose your protection as you go through menopause. And they put menopause usually at 50 uh, years of age. If you look at the, this up here, pre-menopause is usually 10 to 15 years, which is before 50, so 35 to 50, or 40, or 35 to 50, and then your perimenopause is within five years, okay? You get a lot of changes, but this is a huge change between estrogen and progesterone. And in today's society, it's even worse. This is called hot flash C, because this normally is supposed to happen, and what most people don't realize is progesterone could be used in the cortisol pathway, and cortisol is your stress hormone, right? So if you're stressed, you're gonna even diminish progesterone even lower, and estrogen's gonna be up here, and you're still gonna have a difference between estrogen and progesterone. And that's the biggest cause of estrogen dominance, uh, estrogen cancers, uh, estrogen, um, withdrawal, hot flashes, all that stuff. Here's obesity and diet. Fast food's a big one. Margarine increases cancer risk by fivefold. I mean, if you do margarine every morning, um, and you walk out of here, and, and you'd be like, well, I'm gonna still do margarine. I mean, it, it's so obvious, it, 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 it's terrible for you. Water's always better. Dairy products. Dairy products, milk, mostly milk and ice cream. Milk is a huge one. Cheese? Uh, cheese, is, cheese is too. You start getting into microtoxins. Mozzarella, all those are, uh, those are all right. But if you have a history of breast cancer or you have uterine fibroids or um, uterine myomas or all these things that I listed under there, you probably don't want to be in the dairy family because you're going to make things far worse because you're already getting estrogen dominance with his growth promotion or growth signals. Now you're gonna throw dairy on it because now it has bovine growth hormone and you raise insulin growth factor, which is very high. That's what they look at to see if something's gonna create cancer. And genetically modified things, especially uh, dairy and stuff, really raise insulin growth factor. Excess body fat. That's why once you get put on that weight, it's harder to lose it because now, if you get greater than 28%, now your fat tissue starts making it estrogen. And that's a that's an adaptive situation because if you're you know <coughs> that's that's very adaptive to hold hold fat because that means that you're in famine, you're losing, so your body's gonna get more fat. Excess body fat, yes, a low fiber diet and intestinal dysbiosis. You have to keep the, 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 the uh, GI tract moving. If you do not keep the GI tract moving, you'll recirculate the estrogen you were supposed to get out. That's why they tell you to raise your fiber levels. Estrogen can recirculate two, three, four times throughout the body and then that's when you become, you get a liver problem because the liver's supposed to detoxify that out. And if you don't have enough fiber or the bacteria is not right in the lower part of the colon, 
you reabsorb that, and you send the signal back up, and now you get that back. And that, that's deposited as breast tenderness, headaches, migraines, bloating, burping, belching. That's the high fiber. Holy cow, dairy. There's the insulin growth factor. Here's the bovine uh, hormone. Did a Norwegian study, they had three times the risk of developing breast cancer those who drank a half a cup or less of milk. So there's a strong hormonal stimulatory effect on tissues. We're not too different from cows. We got a different hormone too. Okay, this is, this is uh, good here. Well, uh, this is my iodine saturation. <clears throat> Most people don't realize this John Goffman did a, he's a professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California. He used to say 76%. He reviewed all the records from like 1810. That's right around <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, all the radiation, all the records, all the medical. And he came up with a figure, 90% of all cancers, breast cancers, are from medical x-rays. Where do, we, where do we think we get most of the medical x-rays from? Mammograms. The very thing that causes it. I put this up here because this was just from a cell phone, because your cell phone gives off different electromagnetic frequencies. And just put it this way, it's, it's tough to come back when you have radiation poisoning. It's very difficult to come back. As you know, the different radi radiation scenarios in Japan. Um, this just goes to show you, just after talking on the phone for 15 minutes, change that electromagnetic, change that circulation that much. This is a iodine saturation. And this is what I recommend females do to reestablish their, their um, their iodine levels to protect them from radiation. And you're getting it from a lot of different places now. Women need three times more men, uh, more iodine than, than men do. Because of breast tissue, ovarian tissue, and thyroid. Men just need some for the thyroid. You need it for the breast tissue and the uh, ovarian tissue. So you use it up very quickly. And then you get in line every year for your mammogram. These are some of the uses for uh, iodine. Use it for sebaceous cysts, fibrous cystic breasts. Eliminate bowel gas due to beans, beans are good for your heart, low cholesterol. Yeast overgrowth is good for that. These are just different ways that I can apply iodine in, in, a, uh, in a safe way. Now, if you have any type of goiter, <coughs> Um, or thyroid problems, you want to be careful just jumping into this. But, you know, most people uh, can get away with it. If you have a goiter, uh, which is a swollen thyroid, you might want to get it checked out before you jump into this, and I don't see anybody that does. <clears throat> Here's the studies that show that iodine deficient diets uh, induce breast cancer and goiter. Um, here's a study. Uh, Here's a study that happened in India, and apoptosis is good because it's called programmed cell death. It tells the body, hey, this cell's bad, get rid of it, it's only garbage. In human breast cancer cell cultures, iodine shows cytotoxic effects in culture in human breast cells. Here's another study where iodine works as an anti-cancer agent. It binds to the membrane lipids called lactones, which regulate apoptosis. What is your breast tissue? Lipid membranes. That's why it helps with cysts, fibrocystic breasts, polycystic ovary. Cysts. <clears throat> this concluded that iodine treated as a potent antineoplastic effect on the progression of mammary cancers. Here's a couple more. This was from Japan. They showed that the Wakami seaweed, or Lugol's iodine, that they just took off the market. You know, they took the Lugol's iodine off the market, the FDA pulled it off the market. You should call them and ask them why they did that. 
<clears throat> but the same group demonstrated seaweed-induced programmed cell death in human breast, ca breast cancer cells with greater potency than that of chemotherapy. This was in 2008, programmed cell death. I don't know how many more you need here, but these lung cancer cells had been genetically modified to increase iodine uptake, and they were killed. And this came out of Dr. Brown's season. He has a great book if you want to read on iodine. He has a case in here of a 73-year-old patient named Dolores in 2003, took 50 milligrams of iodorol daily, followed up on an ultrasound, refused chemotherapy and radiation and all the other stuff, double mastectomy, all this stuff that they talked about. 18 months, it appeared that these malignancy had diminished size. Two years later on follow-up, come on. Here's another one. A spontaneous regression of breast cancer this was on, uh, on the iodine book on page 63. One patient example was a 63-year-old English teacher to decline conventional treatment, took 50 milligrams. Six weeks later, all these ex existing tumors were disintegrated. <clears throat> Are mammograms safe? If you get one of them, big deal. But every time you get more and more, what happens is it's a cumulative effect. It's worse and worse. It's like getting stung by a bee once or twice. It's not a big deal. But that third or fourth time, your body starts creating a hypersensitivity and you overreact to it. Same thing with this. <clears throat> one week at a high altitude was less than one millirad. Jet flight of six hours was five millirads. A check x-ray is 16. And then a, uh, a, a uh, mammogram is 340 millirads. It's like 21.25 chest x-rays. If you look in the literature, I talked about that BRCA gene. There's a BRCA gene. It's a gene that suppresses tumors to grow. Most people have it. Some people genetically doesn't work as well. But you should never get a mammogram if you have a BRCA gene because the gene is damaged and you're not going to repair the 340 millirads that is damaging the breast tissue and you are, you're off to cancer land. 21.25 x-rays. <clears throat> this was the article that showed up in the New England Journal of Medicine. We got to, you know, we really have to forgive these people. This is absolutely pathetic. I've never, this is like, this is like an atrocity in itself. Uh, they wanted to catch the cancers before they spread. But it, 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 that's not their job. Their job is to find something and treat it. They, this study suggests up to one third of breast cancers or 50 to 70,000 cases a year don't need treatment. What's happening is there's, a, there's an issue with, it's called DCIS, or ductal carcinoma in situ, and that's DCIS. And what they found was, is that this is a pre-malignancy. And only probably 5% of 100% of DCISs actually flow into cancer. So we're rounding everybody up putting everybody through, well, if that's like telling everybody to get out of the sun, I don't have a problem with the sun. You need the sun. You need the mammogram radiation, but you need to get out of the sun. I mean, it's pathetic. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's so funny. You just, you just listen to what they say, and you read their stuff, you're like, oh, what are they doing? Uh, our study raises serious questions about the value of screening. Um, this, is, this is the biggest thing. Uh, although no one can say with certainty which women have cancers that were overdiagnosed, this is certainly about what happens to them. They undergo surgery, 
radiation hormonal therapy, five years or more chemotherapy, or a combination of these. And they, and, and they would have never caused anything. We found that there were only about 0.1 million fewer women with a diagnosis of late stage breast cancer. This discrepancy means there was a lot of overdiagnosed, more than a million women who told they had early stage cancer, most of them who underwent surgery, chemo, and radiation for a cancer that was never going to make them sick. Although it's impossible to know which women these are, that's some serious, that's some serious harm. If you do the math, 93% of the early detection cancer cases studied were false positives. 93%. The American Cancer Society, now, there's a, there's a U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, a group of health experts, in 2009 met, and they revised the standards for women. They said, well, we only want women to get mammograms one every three years instead of one every year, okay? <clears throat> the American Cancer Society still recommends mammograms every year after the age of 40 years old. The U.S. Preventative Service Task Force said, you, need, you would only need that at 50 years of age, and it would be every three years. These are slow progressive. Very rare. You're better off, you're gonna find it on a, um, a palpation or, or, or feeling your own breast doing a breast exam on your own. Uh, here's a recent, okay, so that was 1.3 million women who were told by their lying equipment, but if you don't agree to the treatment, you'll be dead in six months. They, they use this all the time. Goldman Foundation, in short, tell everybody they have cancer and survival will statistically skyrocket. They've been caught blatantly lying because of the benefits of the mammography. Their statistical deception fools most women. They never really had it. All right. Here's the break of one gene, okay? Break of one is a human gene that belongs to a class of genes known as tumor suppressor genes. They suppress tumors. Um, stops the cells from dividing, basically. No division, no growth, uh, uh, no metastasis, nothing. In particular, it inhibits the growth of cells that line the milk ducts in the breast. That's the, the DCIS, ductal situ, in, uh, or ductal carcinoma in situ. Protein made by the BRCA1 gene is directly involved with the repair of the damaged DNA. That's why you don't want to get a mammogram or be exposed to x-ray, because if you get hit with an x-ray and your body can't repair it, it's going to go, it's going to go cancer. cancer. In the nucleus of many types of normal cells, the BRCA1 protein interacts with a protein called RAD51 gene to mend breaks in DNA. <clears throat> the big issue right now is they don't know if it's the chemical or the radiation that's causing the break or the damage. They can't tell. They just know there's gene breakages. So basically, you don't know if there's a lot of, a lot of uh, estrogen or a lot of chemicals like dioxin, or it could have been just from getting five mammographies. So it doesn't matter. They both create breakages. They both do the same damage. But that gene's responsible for that. Okay, this is the this is the uh, and this is the star of the lecture here. This is it right here. <clears throat> Resveratrol prevents. You do not want to silence the break of one gene. You don't want to silence a gene when it's working for you. You're telling it to shut up and sit down when it needs to stand up and get to work. And there's people out there that already have this, shut up and sit down, it's already happening and there's no work at all. This told you resveratrol prevents silencing the break of 
by an aromatic hydrochloride receptor in the human breast cancer cells. Basically, what they're saying is, if you look down here, these results support the hypothesis that silencing the BRCA gene by, there's a, there's a receptor, is preventable with resveratrol and provides the molecular basis for the development of dietary strategies based on natural, not synthetic, natural antagonists. This gene right here, this AR carbon right here, that's your barbecued meat, that's your xeno hormones, that's your chlorine, that's all your chemicals. This gene is responsible for saying, hey, if you got too high of a load, hey, break up, get up, start working. If you make this gene work harder, there's ways to do that, you can actually reduce the effects and, and, and lower your chances of breast cancer or even getting it. This is this was Herbalvite. It has the resveratrol in it. Helps the break of one gene. It also helps support the detoxification genes. I'm gonna keep going here. I want to keep. This is break of two, which is mostly involved with ovarian cancer, but treatment would be the same. Here's urinary tract infections and estradiol. Estradiol is your safe estrogen. Um, if you get chronic urinary tract infections, um, that reestablishes the vaginal epithelial so they get the good bacteria back in there because the estrogen is needed. It's natural estrogen is needed. <clears throat> Michigan Institute of Thermography. I want to explain this for a little bit. Thermography is a, a very important tool and I'll explain it. We're going to start having, this is the first testing in our office. It's going to be set up on February 28th. You actually call the office, this office, not ours. Ours is up here. This number is to your office for the scan. You set up an appointment. You come out to our office on this date and they set up a schedule of time and they'll do a thermography on you. And you can see, you know, what's going on. And I'm gonna explain it real quick. Thermography, there's international guidelines for use. The ages, 20 to 29, assuming low risk results, you should get it every three years for thermography. And I'll explain why you need to do that. Age is 30, you should get one at least once a year. Now, before a tumor grows, it has to establish its feeding system. It needs blood vessels. It needs channels. It needs food. It needs a transportation system. Cancer to live. But before a tumor grows, it has its feeding system. Functional changes that are needed to establish a feeding system, inflammation creates circulation, and then you get new blood vessel growth. These functional changes always occur before structural changes. When they did mammography studies, they found that the tumor had to be 40% progressive before it showed up on mammography. So you're already 40% 40, 40 behind the ball. This shows functional changes way before by projecting heat spots or changes in heat patterns. These abnormal hot spots and heat patterns can be seen up to five plus years before a structural can, structure can change. Cancer doesn't happen overnight. It just doesn't happen. It's slow, progressive. There are some fast ones, like the triple negative, but chronically being bathed in estrogen, chemicals, all that. Here's some of the people that should get thermograms. Anybody 20 years or older had problems with mammograms? Because maybe they, you know, I don't know, I have a problem if anybody had to squeeze my, <laughs> any part like that. I don't know. It's crazy. I mean, we're in the, I mean, we're in the technology is incredible. Mastectomy, lumpectomy, fibrocystic breast, dense breast tissue. There's more false positives on that right there than you would believe. Implants, reduction, smaller, larger breasts, breastfeeding, post-cancer treatment, high risk or just wellness minded. Uh, 
Thermal breast imaging is the only way to see these abnormal hot spots or heat patterns. Mammograms, ultrasounds, and cannot see function, only structure. That's important. We always have function for structure. Um, The thermos scan is the only way to measure risk of uh, future breast disease. Thermos, breast, uh, thermal breast imaging is your early warning sign to let you know that if your road ahead has clear skies or tornadoes, each breast is scored on a one to five. One being the lowest risk, five being the highest risk. You can see if you just pass this around quickly, it's not a big deal. This is one of the reports. So it not only gives you a risk assessment of each breast, but it also gives you an assessment of the, the hormone level, where you know it might be a lot higher than normal. You might want to take some uh, precautions. Age 20 to 29 every three years, and then age 30 once a year. High biotherm risk is eight times more significant than a direct family history for future disease. Remember, 85% of newly diagnosed cases have zero family history. You don't even know. And that DCIS that they call a malignancy, which is really a pre-malignancy, it's kind of like having a polyp. You know, it ain't cancer yet, but it's going. You know, not necessarily. Okay, so. If, if there's any metabolism in there at all, because a lot of these are calcified deposits. The body is taking care of it, and they're left in there, which looks like structures that give you the false positives. But if there's no metabolism in there, there's probably nothing there. So trying to measure your risk, it's one of the better ways to measure your risk. Um, this is a company we use. You try to get the best companies. I know, I know everything's an issue, especially when it comes to money, but there's a lot of shortcuts in the industry. You want to make sure you get with a good company. They have a good re reputation. They're professional when they're doing it because you're dealing with females and breast tissue, and they've got to be professional. Um, a lot of these companies only use a 480 by 640 pixels. Um, the company we use actually uses a, a 76,800 resolution, which I mean, is 400% higher than, than I, I know uh, two companies that use. So using the top of the line equipment. Where's that other thing? Yeah. You know, they mentioned, this was important, I didn't know this, I learned this myself, but they say you should only use a center with both FDA cleared camera and software. Sometimes they don't clear the software, that could be a problem, or the camera. But he says use both of them because they, they, they both have to be approved. Even though I'm not a big FDA fan, um, there is some discretion that needs to be in the industry. Here's the indicators of excess estrogen. Obviously, you can take a history. Symptoms of excess estrogen, that's your estrogen dominance, all those symptoms you have, especially around your cycles. Thermography, you can do a thermography, blood work, or a hormonal panel. And then this is a 216 ratio. Basically, your body metabolizes estrogen a certain way. And when this two ratio is high, your body's doing a wonderful job because it can do it. When this is high and this is low, your body's not metabolizing estrogen and you're actually spilling it over and your chances of cancer are very high. So getting a urine test of this two hydroxy 16 ratio will tell you how your body is functionally. Just like the thermogram tells you how your body's, you know, if anything's metabolizing in the breast, this tells you if your body's metabolizing estrogen through the liver correctly. 
Here's a, here's a research article I just wanted to show you real, real quick. But it says, this study suggests that low urinary 216 ratios are predictors of breast cancer. Profiling estrogen metabolites may identify women who are more probable to develop breast cancer within a population of women with known risk factors and may help to further elucidate clinical relevance of urinary 216 ratios as clinical markers and prognostic indicators in this population. Basically, tell you, you know, who's at more risk than, than anybody. These are one of the uh, products that I use to help regulate estrogen. This product, <clears throat> this product is comparison, how many people have heard of tamoxifen? Okay. This product, tamoxifen, good. You know, you gotta look at the levels here. Obviously, every medical doctor, people have good intentions. Most of people have good intentions. There's good products, there's better products, and there's the best. Very simple. Tamoxifen is a good product. Even though it creates cancer, it does work with the estrogen receptors. But there's a better product, or even the best, and it's this product right here. Because that's what the research shows. And they're not going to use that. They're going to use a synthetic analog of this, which this works wonderfully. <clears throat> I use it for estrogen positive. It worked well against triple negative breast cancer too, which is very aggressive. That worked very well. It works good because of the human papillomavirus. Estrogen is needed for that human papillomavirus to grow. Prostate's a big one because men, men get, uh, get prostate cancer because of estrogen too. And then ovarian laryngeal. Uh, it helps improve the 216 ratio, which is critical. And then you should always, always do a higher protein diet, exercise, sulfur supplements, flax and soy are very beneficial, not the genetically modified soy. Okay? Oh, we're almost done here. Phyto, I use phytoestrogens in, in the office. And I don't use them at high doses. All I'm trying to do is block the receptors. I'm not trying to... Medicine wants to quantify everything. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a place for that. But when you're dealing with estrogen, and it can affect various tissues, and it's very hard to tell, using a phytoestrogen that your body can identify to block receptors could shut off growth, growth signals to some type of tissue that wants to grow. Or could, could, could stop signals like hot flashes, um, temperature changes, vasodilation. That's what I use for a lot of my, uh, my patients for uh, hot flashes, any type. There, there's a lot of symptoms like you saw. But it helps to down-regulate the receptors, prevents proliferation, bone mass density, lowers cholesterol, HDL. So you're using natural phytoestrogens to help with estrogen that was normally supposed to be there at the right level uh, relative to progesterone. Uh, phytoestrogen, this is my, this, this is my whole point, I put it on the wall because everybody's like, oh, you, do you do uh, bioidentical hormone replacement? No, I don't. I, I don't even want to mess with bioidentical hormone replacement. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Um, I'm more along the lines that I'd rather just block the receptors and use a low dose because your body is very responsive when you do that. So basically, you only use one one thousandth as potent as what they would use at a compounding pharmacy or whatever. These are the two products I like to use for different functions. Here's the liver detoxification pathways and support nutrients. We're not going to go over all that, but that's a very important um, for detoxification of estrogen. This is my, my three-week uh, estrogen cleanse program. 
It has a huge detoxification advantage. There's a slow acetylators that can't, mostly Caucasian women that can't get estrogen out of their system. This helps them get it out. It speeds up the enzymes to get them out. Intestinal dysbiosis helps clean up the, the bowels so that certain bacteria give off estrogen too, which is interesting in the colon. Liver biliary cleanse, I mean, if, if you're an estrogen dominant, you have a, you have a gallbladder problem. There's no doubt about it. And that's why a lot of females have gallbladder problems because 50% of the estrogen leaves through your biliary tree or your bile duct through the feces and out. The rest is through the urine. That's why you do the 216 ratio to check the urine. But when the gallbladder's not working, you have a problem there. You're, you're losing 50% uh, get, getting it out. Weight loss is big because of the estrogen dominance. Hormone balance, if you're getting, all your hormones are converted in the liver. So if you have a thyroid problem and you do a detox, you're helping your thyroid because TSH and T4 conversion happen in the liver, okay? So a lot of these conversions happen in the liver. So you just take care of the liver first, see where you're at, then you go up to the thyroid and maybe give a little bit of, you know, uh, a little bit of support in the thyroid or the adrenals. And then the uh, detoxification pathways. Um, all right, so, all right, real quick, um, <clears throat> Jason's doing a camera back there. It's his birthday today. I want us to sing happy birthday to him. <laughs> he didn't need to be here. It was his birthday. I didn't realize that. And um, so let, let's sing happy birthday to Jason. You can double time, right? <laughs> Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Jason, happy birthday to you. And I just want to acknowledge, Jason and Randy are doing an excellent job with all the video. They've been uploading it. I've been putting it on my webpage. They converted all my old videos. So they've been doing a tremendous job uh, doing that. And then I just want to give Jason a happy birthday card. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Krieger. Look at this. Now, is there any questions? You can't wash the inside of it. You're washing the entity to the eat. So that I mean that's a big issue with dioxin, DDT, all those chemicals, because their half-lives are so long, they don't break down, and they're actually in the soils that people have treated in these old houses, and they had a little garden or whatever, and you can't get the, you can't wash that out. And that's the big that that's the big issue with my daily protocol or getting on a program that suits you is to target areas that you know you have weaknesses and, and, and take care of those every day. Make sure you're, you're guarded every day against those things. That's the whole idea of you know you think you have a lot of control, but you really don't. And you, and you should be conscious of what you can control, but a lot of it you can't. So that's why we. Put that up there because you're just being realistic. You're not going to control that much. I mean, you're not. Gonna, you're not. You probably didn't even know that you probably eat, you know, genetically modified corn today. Ninety, ninety percent of it is. But you don't know because there's no label. And you could have went to a Mexican restaurant. That, so you have no idea if there's no label. And that's the point. So, good question. 
estrogen dominant, and you start to supplement with progesterone, some sort of natural progesterone, either mm -hmm. the cream or the pills. Sure. Do you have an opinion on, that's a two-part question, do you have an opinion on one of those being better than the other, the cream versus the pills? And then, but the actual question I was trying to get at is, um, can you take too much progesterone then at that point? And is that going to do the trick to, once you, you get it in balance, Right. That's why. I mean, that's why. If you're if you're that bad in estrogen dominance and you had a lot of problems and stuff, that's why you want to follow up the blood work okay. and you want to see where those numbers are, so that you can you know use an objective scale to change those. But the other question is is that I, I like to use I use sublingual progesterone, and I like sublingual progesterone because it goes right into your system. As far as the fat, I don't know if the fat's going to spill over into the blood or not when you use the creams. So I can regulate a sublingual better than I can regulate a cream. So everybody's company's different. You you might you could have put less fat than me. Somebody else could have more fat than me. So how do you regulate that dosage? So there's nothing wrong with getting a general dosage, but. Um, I use the Progon B mostly because I like the sublingual, and I sometimes I use pills for for uh, for, for progesterone, but they all got to be converted, and you have to have a healthy digestive tract. So I try to get around that by doing sublingual, get that going, and then you do a detox, or you get things going, and then you change that type of environment, and then you don't have you're not backtracking. You know what I mean? So you can get kind of tangled up in it, but. I like the sublingual. Um, you can do blood work to test that. At your office? Yep. Yep. You can use blood work to test that. We'll just send that right out. Um, you can do the Acera testing, tells you that too. Shows up with that. Uh, you can go on your symptoms and, and dose it. When, when is the worst time during your monthly cycle where you have those, those, those exaggerated symptoms? And then you can target that time to use the progesterone and you can play with it yourself. Simple stuff. So you don't have to be too mentally giant about it, but you can, you know, but if you want to be, we can run the blood test. So it just depends where you're at. Everybody's a little bit different. Yep. Um, let me show somebody. Have you ever seen the muscle testing? All right, let me do a quick test. You want to, you want to do a quick test? Sure. Um, standing up? Yeah, come on up here to the front. I want to show you. There's a way that this is the way I muscle test. Somebody comes in, you want it somewhere to start. I mean, every, things can get complicated <laughs> in science, but you want a place to start. And you want a place to jump in and you know there's an issue because the body is very electrochemical. And you don't, nothing happens chemically unless it changes electrically. So electri electrical leads chemical. Okay? So what I do is it come over here. Do you have two strong arms? Do I have strong arms? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. No neck problems? No. So what I like to do is <laughs> uh, what I like to do is I like to test how she has strong. So resist me as I push down. Good. So what I do, give her something pathetic or awful that I know her body doesn't respond very well to, like a cigarette, hold strong, and her, her weakness holds strong, her muscle test goes down. So that overwhelms her nervous system because it's bad for her. So now we know she's testable because she tested strong, now she tested weak because it was crappy. If I put an apple in your hand, you would test strong. Okay? Because apple is good for you. Even if it had pesticides on it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it would be yeah. <laughs> See? Like I told you, the world's getting complicated. <laughs> so what you like to do, hold strong. So what I like to do is I like to go through the hormonal <coughs> system. So I'll go up here on the left side of the brain up here, hold strong. That's her anterior pituitary. If something's going on with her anterior pituitary, because everything happens up there, I'd have to go up there and treat. Posterior pituitary, good. I would come up through here. Here's her nervous breakdown reflex. That's her master hormone for her brain. 
I could check her adrenals. Here's her hold strong. Here's her thyroid. Hold strong. Here's her thyroid. We got something to work with right off the bat. We know there's a problem with her thyroid. We don't know how bad it is. I don't know what I want to do with it yet. <laughs> so I want to test it. I want to check positive, negative. There's negative, so it's not a hyperthyroid. It's positive, it's a hypo. So right off the bat, she's got a hypothyroid primary right there, and that's causing it. It's not up there. You gotta check her ovaries because it might be back clogging to there. There's an ovary. Hold strong. Nope. Positive, positive. You test breast tissue just like this. But you go back to the thyroid, it goes big. <laughs> so she's got a primary hypothyroid. So what would we probably do first? Maybe iodine. Iodine is very important for T4, T3 conversion, TSH, T4. So I don't have my kit with me, but we test iodine to see if that helps her. Now, we'd ask her, hey, have you been having any symptoms of hypothyroid, which is cold hands and feet, you don't pluck your eyebrows, your eyebrows will fall off the lateral third. Eyebrows, you know, maybe her metabolism isn't as fast as it should be. Maybe when you look at her hands, calluses aren't bad. Sometimes if you can't convert beta carotene to vitamin A, you'll deposit that yellow in your hands if you're a juicer, or the bottoms of your feet will be yellow. Um, liver biliary. So these are all things you can look at and get a judgment, but I know she's a thyroid. Okay? So I take my testing kit, go through, tell you what you need to take, and then I tell you the dosage, and then you would follow up with me. But our prime objective is to shut that off. If I can shut it off with what I have out of my kit, wonderful, you don't have to do anything. If I can't shut it off, what would it So you can take it to the next level and see where you're at. But a lot of times you just push the body in the right direction and it comes back around. Sometimes it doesn't because you, you've had this thought, you didn't even know it because your body's been compensating, okay? So that's the first thing I do, and then I would order a TSH, T4, T3, reverse T3, maybe a cortisol, maybe an estrogen and progesterone. Okay. So I go from there. Okay. <laughs> but that's how I would handle that for her just going through. And then you can test, obviously you can test the ovaries. You can test the ovaries. You can test the thiamine reflex. You can test the master reflex. You can test the minerals. Dehydration. You can test her for infections. Maybe infections causing this. No. Yeast. No. Viral. So that's the basics. So right off the gist, she's a perfect specimen to come up here. And she tested perfect. It was easy. It was right in front of me. <laughs> so that's what I would do. Treat your thyroid. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. You always take uh, 12.5, or if you use a KI complex, which is the potassium iodide from uh, Zorex, you should take one of them every day. The liquid iodine? Uh, you'd have to take, I think it's uh, probably 120 grams to equal that. So, the liquid iodine is not for an acute situation. It's more just, you know, after you went through and saturated yourself, then you do the kind of the liquid. But if you find out if you have an issue, obviously you want to really get up higher on that dosage. You're using it uh, a little bit more aggressively. Maybe you're working and there's a Verizon cell tower ahead of you on top of the roof. You're getting, you know, there's a lot of scenarios. You live next to the airport. The iodine? Yeah, because it helps thin secretions, thin the mucus. It, co it stops the colonization of viruses in the sinuses and throat, so you can gargle it. Uh, it keeps the blood thin. I mean, it, 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 you know, that's why I use it in my food protocol. It's a very good product. But for you, iodine, you're using it more surface-wise and maybe for a little bit of thyroid, but you're not really digging into that thyroid using the liquid right now.
Yeah. So like, say you know you have like a dental appointment for one of your kids and they want to do like the pan dental, like are those mm -hmm. really bad for the kids? Especially being like going to the orthodontist and they want to get the x-rays every like year, see how you're Yeah, you don't do that. How, don't so how do they like put the braces on without having the x-ray? Well, maybe you want to take your kid and saturate him with the iodine so that he doesn't get damaged from it. I'll tell you what I did. I got him on the insert machine and detached him afterwards. Well, yeah, you detached. Don't you have to do iodine buildup before you're exposed? Exactly. It's harder to do it once you're. So the liquid iodine would that be enough for? For a kid, yeah. You probably like do maybe. Because I, I would do a half a dropper every day, okay. just to fill her, fill her stores. Okay. That's what I would do. But yeah, any type of medical device, X-rays, all that stuff. You know, I know you got to weigh the the benefits and the risks. If braces are, are you know, uh, you know, a benefit over a risk, then you want to take the preventative and, and, and cover that area. It's not a problem. Some people come in there and they want to get the flu shot. I'm like, that's stupid. But <laughs> if you take the IAG, you know, or with the liquid iodine, stuff like that, at least you're protecting yourself and you'll acquire your immunity better and you won't have the chance of a side effect. Because you have your, you know, you, you have your, uh, see, yeah, thanks for coming. You know, you have your bouncers ready. There's a problem. You, you got your immune system on heightened alert and it's ready to go. You got nothing, you, if you got no nutrition or natural compounds cycling those white blood cells through their normal cycle and you're deficient, you're going to have a deficit. There's going to be a problem. I love my mother, Dennis, you know, he always bugged me and says, Is it x ray? I said, No. I said, You should have done I don't think so. I let you myself wrong. He said, Well, it won't really, it won't bother you. Is that right? Why are you putting that five-pound shield on me? I wonder how you have room for it. Hello. Yeah. Well, that's the big thing. I, I, I you know, I, I'm not a big chemotherapy person, but when you deal with this chemotherapy, these pharmacists are getting cancer just from handling the chemotherapy. And you would think OSHA would come in and say, "Hey, this is toxic." If it was at a Ford plant or a Chrysler plant or in my office. They'd be all over me, but chemotherapy is the most toxic, and the OSHA doesn't say anything. And people are getting cancer from it. So when you start putting these things together in your head, they don't make sense. But the biggest thing, obviously, is prevention. But if you run into a, a snag or a scenario, I got a lot of knowledge behind what to do in that situation. Can I remind you that the library will be closing in 15 minutes. Thank you. This thermoscan is called. Is it pretty much like the one on Royal? No. No? Better? Better. The one in where? Uh -huh. The resolution is totally different. Okay. And their cam their software and cameras are FDA approved. I don't know if that company is that over there. But I you know, there, there's a lot of First of all, that I, the thermoscan, are we on tape? Thermoscan one <laughs> that I sent people to, well, they went totally like medical, where I'm a chiropractor, I couldn't even order a, a thermoscan for somebody that needed one. And I've been working with these people for almost 12 years. I have to have one session with the doctor yeah. and you. And I'm like, yeah. what is it? You and know, you know what I'm paying for? It. Yeah, insurance you're paying it. for it. And I have and they can't, they can't just send it back to me. They did it all the time before, and now they're playing games, and I'm gonna play a game with them. I'm not sending anybody over there anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Very simple. Yeah, just follow it. Because it's worth it. I, I, the technology is totally worth it. But I'm, the more I'm finding out, the more I'm like, well, maybe it was a good idea that maybe it didn't work out, because there's better, I'm finding better compatibility with the other place. I said, oh, pull, pull those out. Get, pull out uh, two of those. So, but,
Shapiro and Barbara Zerlick. You know, you can give mine to someone who hasn't had the test, because I've had the test. That's nice to be Barbara. Oh, really? That's sweet of you. Is it Carol Bryan? Yeah. <laughs> no, the uh, the Acera, no, the oh, okay. machine out of the office. Okay. There's a pamphlet back there if you want to read it. Yep. So, and uh, pull another one out because I don't want to be like, oh yeah, you can have it. <laughs> Everybody wants it. Sandra Bukowski. <laughs> All right, other than that, if you have any questions, you can call the office. Um, I'm always looking for new patients. <laughs> Be honest. But you know, people don't realize there's a lot you can do nutritionally with breast, breast cancer, like I said up here, and showed you up here. There's a ton of things. I don't really treat cancer. It's more blessed health, but we can target some uh, some new things, and uh, the chances are tremendous. Uh, we're surviving.